chapter six of catherine de bora or social and domestic scenes in the life of luther this is a LibriVox recording all LibriVox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit LibriVox org. recording by kathleen catherine de bora or social and domestic scenes in the life of luther by john g morris chapter six catherine a widow her support sufferings journeys death no one was more deeply distressed at his death than the mourning widow for more than twenty years she had lived with him in uninterrupted harmony had sought to alleviate his sufferings and had shared his joys and she was not permitted to see him die nor minister to his last wants even if he did die among friends yet she was not there to smooth his pillow and to perform those tender offices which an affectionate wife alone knows how to do when on the twenty second of february the corpse was conveyed to wittenberg and deposited in the castle church and all the inhabitants of the city went to meet the melancholy procession there stood catherine weeping and with her children looked on her deceased husband she survived him nearly seven years and cherished his memory most affectionately though his enemies assailed him most virulently when he was no longer present to defend himself yet she never allowed her affection to cool nor her interest in his work and reputation to abate the black velvet cloth which had covered the funeral car came into the possession of the widow and for many years it was preserved among luther's posterity as a valuable memento neither did the elector forget her he wrote her a letter of condolence in which he sought to comfort her on the grounds of the happy death of her husband and the secret wise counsel of god at the same time he repeated his assurances of his protection of her and her children although luther had expressed a desire that catherine should remove from wittenberg fearing that after his death she might not be able to support herself there yet induced by good reasons she resolved to spend the remainder of her days in that place for where could she expect to find better friends than in wittenberg buchenhagen Krusiger, melanchthon and others were still living who were her counsellors and comforters and wittenberg was also the place where her sons had already begun their education and where they could most advantageously finish it luther had some time before his death made ample provision consisting of various kinds of property for his wife which she was to hold independent of her children in the event of her remaining a widow in the document conveying it to her he speaks of her in the most exalted terms as a pious woman a faithful wife and an affectionate mother the property thus left was far from being sufficient to maintain the widow and her children the elector of saxony agreeably to his promise contributed to her support the dukes of mansfeld and the king of denmark also liberally came to her help the elector john frederick of saxony who had already paid the funeral expenses thus wrote to dr scherf professor of medicine and rector of the university and as we have heard that the widow of the sainted luther is in need of pecuniary assistance we send you by this messenger one hundred gold groschen for her use he also wrote to Krusiger and melanchthon the guardians of the children to select a teacher for the two younger sons martin and paul with whom they should also board he directed that with regard to the oldest son john they should wait six months longer to ascertain whether he was inclined or qualified to study a learned profession and if not the elector promised to give him employment in his palace as a clerk or secretary to enable the guardians to execute his wishes with regard to the children the elector sent them two thousand guilders he likewise afterwards sent the same sum to the widow the dukes of mansfeld for whose benefit luther had undertaken many journeys and suffered much trouble were not behind 
in the same year they established a fund of two thousand guilders for the benefit of the widow and children from which they drew an annual interest of one hundred guilders part of the capital only was paid for when catherine died in fifteen fifty two one thousand guilders still stood to her credit the year after luther's death christian the third king of denmark transferred for her benefit fifty dollars the remainder of a sum which he had previously granted to luther and several of his friends catherine wrote to the king expressing her profound gratitude for this act of benevolence but she was soon called on to experience additional sorrows the small called war had already broken out in fifteen forty six which brought desolation into many peaceful and happy families catherine did not escape the general calamity the elector john frederick who would certainly have done more for her was taken prisoner at the battle of malberg april twenty fourth fifteen forty seven wittenberg was besieged on the fifth of may and on the twenty fifth charles v with his spanish troops entered the city as conqueror all the faithful subjects of the elector and many persons who had embraced the doctrines of the reformation had left before the siege the widow of the reformer with her children could not possibly remain behind she accompanied dr george major professor of theology to magdeburg and thence sustained by the town council of helmstadt she went under melanchthon's protection to brunswick from whence dr major was to conduct her to copenhagen here she expected further protection and support from the king of denmark as her illustrious benefactor the elector of saxony could no longer assist her but she did not proceed farther than gifhorn near brunswick for a proclamation appeared promising a safe return and the secure possession of their property to all who had left the country it seemed best to her as well as to melanchthon to return to the home she had abandoned but her life from this period was an unbroken series of sorrows the assistance she had formerly received from the liberality of the elector was withdrawn the annual contribution of the king of denmark although he had promised further help had not been sent since fifteen forty eight and her small real estate was loaded with taxes it would have been difficult for her to support herself and four children if she had not some time subsequently mortgaged her little farm at zilsdorf for four hundred guilders and pawned some silver ware for six hundred guilders she also rented out several rooms in her house as her husband had done and boarded the occupants and thus she contrived to gain a meagre subsistence in the beginning of the year fifteen forty eight she travelled with melanchthon to leipzig in order to solicit from the imperial assessor some diminution of the oppressive war tax melanchthon also wrote to the king of denmark entreating him to continue the annual contribution which he made during luther's lifetime buchenhagen wrote similar letters to his majesty begging him for luther's sake to come to the help of the poor widow and her children but as these repeated appeals were fruitless she herself wrote to him october sixth fifteen fifty in this letter she calls to his mind the services which her illustrious husband had rendered to the cause of christianity and his majesty's former liberality to him in pathetic terms she represents her destitute condition and the severity of the times occasioned by the existing wars she says your imperial majesty is the only king on earth to whom we poor christians can fly for protection and god will doubtless richly reward your majesty for the kindness you have bestowed on poor christian preachers and their widows and children this letter did not immediately produce the desired result two years afterwards when most sorely pressed by want she repeated her entreaty and wrote again in this letter she complains of her forsaken condition and declares that she had been more unkindly treated by professed friends than enemies she writes in a deeply desponding tone and seems to be on the brink of despair buchenhagen seconded this appeal to the king and it was successful 
a contribution was received which relieved her immediate wants and comforted her desponding heart luther's exalted merits were not always recognized at least not in the way in which they should have been the widow of the man who conferred favors on thousands at the expense of extraordinary self-sacrifice often pined in misery and paid the severe penalty of his disinterestedness and liberality with much truth could it be said in a discourse commemorative of her virtues during the war she wandered from place to place with her orphan children enduring the most trying privations and perils and besides the numerous trials of her widowhood she also encountered much ingratitude from many and she was often shamefully deceived by those even from whom she had a right to expect kindnesses on account of the inappreciable services of her husband to the church after the peace of passau july thirty one fifteen fifty two security was re-established for the protestants and the former elector of saxony was restored to liberty about this time a contagious disease broke out in wittenberg and all the members of the university removed to torgau catherine also determined to leave the place with her two younger sons martin and paul john was studying at konigsberg and her only daughter margaret was to follow them a short time after on the journey the horses became unmanageable and ran away with the carriage catherine more concerned about the children than her own safety and with the hope of facilitating their escape leaped out of the vehicle and fell violently into a ditch full of water this painful accident gave such a severe shock to her system that she was conveyed to torgau in a very weak condition where she took her bed and never left it alive her illness increased from day to day and soon assumed the decided character of consumption two months after december twenty fifteen fifty two she died in the fifty-fourth year of her age her funeral was attended by an immense crowd of persons the professors students and citizens united in demonstrations of respect for the deceased widow of the illustrious reformer during the whole period of her sickness she comforted herself with the promises of god's word she heartily prayed for a peaceful departure out of this vale of tears she frequently commended the church and her children to the continued protection of god and her daily supplication was that the true doctrine which the lord had given to the world through her deceased husband might be transmitted uncorrupted to posterity a plain monument in the city church of torgau designates the place where her remains repose on the monument or tombstone there is a recumbent statue the size of life with an open bible pressed to the heart the inscription is anno fifteen fifty two den twenty december ist in god selig int schlafen ad her zu torgau hern d martin luther's seligen hinterlassen witwe katharina von bora end of chapter six Chapter 7, Part 1 of Catherine de Bora, or Social and Domestic Scenes in the Life of Luther. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Bill Mosley, Llano County, Texas, USA. Catherine de Bora, or Social and Domestic Scenes in the Life of Luther by john g morris chapter seven luther's children domestic character catherine catherine had been the mother of six children three sons and three daughters one john born june seventh fifteen twenty six studied law and became a civil officer in the services of the elector of saxony died october twenty seventh fifteen seventy five aged fifty years two elizabeth born december tenth fifteen twenty seven died august third fifteen twenty eight three magdalena born may fourth fifteen twenty nine died september twentieth fifteen forty two age fourteen 
4. Martin, born November 7th, 1531, studied theology, died March 3rd, 1565, age 34. 5. Paul, born January 28th, 1533, studied medicine and became court physician to the elector of Saxony, died March 8th, 1593, aged 61 years. 6. Margaret, born December 17th, 1534, died 1570, aged 36 years. Luther was accustomed to say, quote, The more children we have, the more happiness we enjoy. They are the loveliest fruits and bonds of the domestic life. End quote. He was never more happy than in the circle of his family, and whoever saw him there forgot that he was the man who spoke without fear or trembling with emperors, kings, and nobles. He was much averse to noisy entertainments. Quote, I lose too much time at such festal gatherings with the citizens. I do not know what demon it is that prevents me from abandoning them, and yet they do me much harm, end quote, said he. It was in the bosom of his family and in the company of a few select friends in which he sought the most agreeable relaxation from the burdensome cares of his life and gathered fresh vigor for his arduous labors. Surrounded by his wife and children, and by the side of his intimate friends, as Spalatin, Bugenhagen, Krusiger, Melanchthon, and a few others, he took part in the innocent amusements of life with a full heart of gratitude to God, who favored him with these evening relaxations. In 1543 he celebrated his 62nd birthday, and invited Melanchthon, Bugenhagen, Krusiger, George Major, and Eber. It was the last time he celebrated that day. Subjects of solemn import came up for conversation. Luther, in a prophetic spirit, said, quote, As long as I live with God's help, there will be no danger, and Germany will continue peaceful. But when I die, then pray. There will be really need of prayer. Our children shall have to grasp their weapons and there will be sad times for Germany. Hence I say, pray diligently after my death. End quote. He then turned to Eber particularly and said, quote, Your name is Paul. Hence be careful, after Paul's example, to preserve and defend the doctrine of that apostle. End quote. Luther was a man of sociable disposition, always enjoying conversation, enlivened by wit, and edifying anecdote. He excelled in spicy conversation himself, and was the life of every circle of distinguished men. But he especially found the sweetest enjoyment in conversation with his wife and children, and often, too, from the innocent prattle of the latter, he derived no ordinary edification. When his heart was sad, he would take one of them into his arms and tenderly caress it. Thus, on more than one occasion, he took the youngest child, and pressing it to his bosom, with deep emotion, exclaimed, quote, Ah, what a blessing these little ones are, of which the vulgar and the obstinate are not worthy. End quote. On another occasion, he said, quote, I am richer than all papal theologians in the world, for I am contented with little. I have a wife and six children, whom God has bestowed on me, such treasures the papistic divines do not deserve. End quote. Little Martin was once playing with a dog. See, said Luther, who took a religious view of the most ordinary circumstances, and thus also in social life he became the teacher of those around him. See, said he, quote, this child preaches God's word in its actions. For God says, Have then dominion over the fishes of the sea and the beasts of the earth for the dog suffers himself to be governed by the child. End quote. On one occasion this same child was speaking of the enjoyments of heaven, and said, quote, In heaven loaves of bread grow on the trees. End quote. The father replied with a smile, quote, The life of children is the happiest and best of all, for they have no worldly cares, they know nothing about fanatics and errorists in the church, and have only pure thoughts and pleasant reflections. End quote. He was amusing himself one day with the child and said, quote, We were all once in this same happy state of mind in Eden, 
simple, upright, without guile or hypocrisy, we were sincere, just as this child speaks of God, and in earnest. End quote. At another time he remarked that Martin afforded him special delight because he was his youngest child. Quote, we do not find such natural kindness in old persons. It does not flow so freely and fully. That which is colored or feigned loses our favor. It is not so impressive. It does not afford as much pleasure as that which springs up naturally from the heart. Hence children are the best playmates. They speak and do everything sincerely and naturally. How Abraham's heart must have beat, he continued, when he was called on to sacrifice his son. I do not think he told Sarah anything about it. I could contend with God if he demanded anything similar of me. End quote. Here the maternal feeling of Catherine was roused, and she observed, quote, I cannot believe that God could demand of parents the slaughter of their children. End quote. He removed her objections by reminding her of the greater sacrifice which God the Father made of offering his own son as a ransom for our sins. Margareta was once speaking to her father of Jesus, the angels, and heaven. Deeply moved, he exclaimed, Quote, oh, how much better than ours is the faith and life of children. The words which they hear they accept with joy and without any doubts and are happy. But we old fools have painful anxieties and dispute long. Well, has Christ said, unless ye be converted and become as little children, ye cannot enter the kingdom of heaven. End quote. Christmas particularly was a season of joyful festival in Luther's family. No annual fair, such as are to this day held in Germany, passed by in which he did not purchase presents for his children. With deep regret, he wrote to his wife when he was in Torgau in 1532 that he could find nothing in that town to buy for the little ones at home. Vocal and instrumental music was a frequent source of family entertainment, especially after supper. Luther himself accompanied it with the flute or the lute, both of which he played skillfully. He often invited accomplished singers, and thus held family concerts in his house. When his time and the weather permitted, he had repaired to what was afterwards called Luther's Spring, which he himself discovered, and over which, after his marriage, he had a neat summer house erected. He spent many an hour of pleasant enjoyment in his garden, with his wife engaged with her needle and the children playing around him. Here he often invited his friends to exhibit to them the luxuriant fruit of his own cultivation. As the children increased in years, especially the sons, he made them his companions. He took them with him on his numerous journeys, and they accompanied him on his last and eventful tour to the place of his birth, and as it proved, the place of his death. That he might enjoy the society of his wife as much as possible, he pursued his labors with her at his side or invited her into his study. She often copied his manuscripts for the press, and otherwise rendered aid in writing. He communicated to her everything of special interest relating to the progress of the Reformation, not only orally when at home, but by letter during his absence. He also frequently read aloud for her entertainment, and sometimes even extracts from the books of his opponents, such as Erasmus and others. He often gave her striking passages of scripture to commit to memory, such as Psalm 31, which was particularly applicable to her condition after his death, just as though he had anticipated it years before. She, on the other hand, often urged him to the performance of pressing duties, especially answering letters. Her participation in his affairs was kindly reciprocated by him. He patiently listened to all her requests and in his letters executed many of her commissions. It was only when he desired to complete some work which allowed no postponement that he dispensed with her presence. At such times he locked himself in his study for days and ate nothing but bread and salt, that he might, without interruption, pursue the work in hand. This often occurred, and he would not allow himself to be disturbed. On one occasion he had been thus locked up for three days, she sought him everywhere, shed bitter tears, knocked at all the doors, and called him, but no one answered. 
She had the door opened by a locksmith and found her husband profoundly absorbed in the explanation of the twenty-second psalm. She was proceeding to reprimand him for occasioning such painful anxiety that he was impatient of the interruption to his studies, pointed to the Bible and said, quote, Do you think, then, that I am doing anything bad? Do you not know that I must work as long as it is day, for the night cometh in which no man can work? End quote. But his tone and look sufficiently indicated to her that he was, after all, not unduly excited. At his social assemblies, his walks for recreation, and short excursions into the country, she was his inseparable companion as often as circumstances permitted. When numerous business calls necessarily compelled him to leave home, he wrote to her the most affectionate and often the most humorous letters. The birth of his first child, June seventh, 1526, afforded him peculiar gratification. He communicated the fact to many of his correspondents in a strain of pleasant humor, and, of course, received their congratulations in return. The child was baptized soon after birth by Dr. Rohrer, and named John by the grandfather. Bugenhagen, Jonas, and the painter Kronik Sr. were his godfathers. From his earliest years, this boy excited the liveliest hopes in his parents on account of his uncommon mental abilities, and it was he who gave occasion to the preparation by the father of several excellent books for children. Luther possessed the rare faculty of letting himself down to the capacity of children without himself becoming a child. This son's name often occurs in the letters of Luther, and he is always mentioned as a lad of uncommon promise and an agreeable plaything to his father and mother. He thus writes to Hausmann, quote, Besides this, there is nothing new except that my Lord has blessed my Kate and made her a present of a healthy son. Thanks and praise for his unspeakable goodness. Mother and child send their respects to you. End quote. Sometime after he wrote to Spalatin, quote, My little Hans salutes you. He is now teething and begins to scold everybody about him with the most amiable reproaches. Kate also wishes you every blessing, and particularly that you also may have a little Spalatin, who may teach you what she boasts of having learned from her boy, namely, the joys of matrimonial life, of which the Pope and his satellites are not worthy. Quote. Luther's friends were much attached to this child on account of his amiable disposition, and sent him many presents suitable to his age. When the boy was yet but four years old, his father wrote to him the following letter, quote, Grace and peace in Christ, my dearest little son, it pleases me much to hear that you love to learn and to pray. Continue in this good way, my child. When I come home, I will bring you a beautiful present. I know where there is a beautiful garden into which many children go. They wear gilded garments and gather all manner of fruit from under the trees. They sing, leap, and are happy. They also have beautiful little horses with golden bridles and silver saddles. I asked the man who owns the garden what sort of children they were. He replied, they are children who love to pray, to learn, and serve God. Then I said, My dear sir, I also have a son called little Hans Luther. May he not also go into the garden, that he too may eat these beautiful apples and pears, and ride these nice horses, and play with these good children. He answered, Every little boy who loves to pray and learn and is good may come into the garden. Lippus and Yost also, sons of Melanchthon and Jonas, and if they all come together, they shall have all sorts of musical instruments, and dance, and shoot with little crossbows. And he pointed out to me a meadow in the garden, suited for a children's playground, and there were hanging golden instruments of music and beautiful silver crossbows. But it was yet early, and the children had not yet eaten their breakfast. Hence I could not wait to see the children dance and play, and I said to the man, Ah, my dear sir! I will go without delay and write all this to my beloved little son, Hans, that he may diligently pray, learn well, and be pious, so that he too may come into this garden, but he has a little sister, Lena, whom he must bring with him. Then the man said, It must be so, 
Go, and write to him. For this reason, dear son, learn and pray, and tell Lippus and Yost also to do the same, and then you shall all go into the garden. I commend you to God. Kiss Nina for me. Your dear father, M. L. 1530. End quote. The prudent discipline of the mother, exercised with tender earnestness, gradually developed the moral and intellectual faculties of this youth in an eminent degree, and this, combined with his religious and scientific attainments, as subsequently displayed, afforded the father unspeakable gratification. In his fifteenth year this youth received the most honorable testimonial of his industry in study and general excellence of character from John William, the second son of the elector John Frederick, promising further encouragement and aid in the prosecution of his studies. When he was properly qualified by preliminary attainments to attend a higher school, he was sent to the gymnasium at Torgau. Afterwards he studied law at Wittenberg and Königsberg, and on his return from his travels in various countries of Europe, he was appointed court counselor by John William, in which office he subsequently served under the brother of the elector. He was dismissed at his own request, and entered the service of Duke Albert in Königsberg, and died October 28, 1575, aged 49 years. End of chapter 7, part 1. Recording by Bill Mosley, Llano County, Texas, USA. Chapter 7, part 2 of Catherine de Bora, or Social and Domestic Scenes in the Life of Luther. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Bill Mosley, Llano County, Texas, USA. Catherine Deborah, or Social and Domestic Scenes in the Life of Luther, by John G. Morris. His second child, Elizabeth, was born during the prevalence of the contagious disease in Wittenberg, before alluded to. She lived only nine months, and Luther's grief at her death was excessive. He thus writes to Hausmann, quote, Never could I have believed a parent's heart could be so tender towards children. Seldom have I mourned so deeply. My sorrow is like that of a woman. End quote. The death of his third child, Magdalena, at the age of fourteen, was a severe affliction. She was a girl of unusual promise, amiable, gifted, and pious. Her complete resignation to the will of God, her vivid conception of the doctrines of the Bible, her strong faith in the Savior, and her filial and religious virtues distinguished her far above many of her tender years. She was for a long time confined to bed, and she felt that her end was rapidly drawing nigh. She ardently desired to see her brother John, who was a student at the academy at Torgau. The father gratified her wish and dispatched a messenger to summon the absent son to the deathbed of his sister. Luther, as far as was possible, watched by the side of the dying child. Although the trial was severe, his patient submission to the will of God was characteristic of the man and the Christian. Alas, sighed he, quote, I love this child most tenderly, but, O oh God, as it is thy will to take her to thyself, I cheerfully resign her into thy hands. End quote. Then he advanced to the bed and spoke to the suffering child, quote, Magdalena, my daughter, you would willingly remain with your father on earth, and yet you also desire to go to your father in heaven. End quote. On which she replied, quote, Yes, dearest father, just as it pleases God. End quote. He continued, quote, Dearest child, the spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak. End quote. Overcome by emotion, he turned away and said, 
Oh, how I love the suffering child! But if the flesh is now so strong, what will then the spirit be? Well, whether we live or die, we are the Lord's. When she was breathing her last, the mother, overwhelmed with sorrow, retired from the couch. Luther threw himself on his knees, wept convulsively, and implored God to release the child from suffering. He then took her by the hand, and she died. The father at once had recourse to the scriptures to seek consolation for his grievous loss. He opened the book, and the passage, Romans 14.7, first arrested his attention. Quote, for none of us liveth to himself, and no man dieth to himself. End quote. This expressive passage was as a balm to his wounded heart. When the body was deposited in the coffin, he said, quote, Thou dear Magdalena, how happy thou art! O dear Magdalena, thou wilt rise again, and wilt shine like a star, yea, like the sun. End quote. But the coffin having been made too small, he said, quote, This bed is too small for her now that she is dead. I am indeed joyful in the spirit, but after the flesh I am very sad. The flesh is slow to come to the trial. This separation troubles us exceedingly. It is a marvelous thing to know that she is certainly happy, and yet for me to be so sad. End quote. When the people came to attend the funeral, and, according to custom, addressed the doctor and said that they sincerely condoled with him in his affliction, he said, quote, You should rejoice. I have sent a saint to heaven, yea, a living saint. Oh, if only such a death were ours, such a death I would be willing to die this moment. End quote. When one said, Quote, that is indeed true, yet we all wish to retain our relatives. End quote. Luther replied, quote, Flesh is flesh, and blood is blood. I rejoice that she has passed over. I experience no sadness but that of the flesh. End quote. Again he said to others present, quote, Be not grieved. I have sent a saint to heaven. Yea, I have sent two. End quote. When she was buried, he said, quote, It is the resurrection of the flesh. End quote. And when they returned from the funeral, he said, quote, Now is my daughter provided for, both as to body and soul. We Christians have no cause to complain. We know that it must be thus. We are perfectly assured of eternal life. For God, who through his Son and for the sake of his Son, has promised it unto us, cannot lie. End quote. Throughout the whole of this trying event, Luther showed all the tenderness of an affectionate father and all the resignation of a Christian. His second son, Martin, was tenderly cherished by the father, he himself feared that the child would be spoiled by too much affectionate attention and favoritism. In reference to this, he said, quote, The love of parents is always stronger for the younger than the elder children, and the more they require the care and protection of the parents, the more dear they are to them. Thus, my Martin is now my dearest treasure, because he demands more of my attention and solicitude. John and Magdalena can walk and talk and can ask for what they want and do not require so much watchful nursing. End quote. But afterwards, Luther's anxieties about him were very great. Quote, he is rather a wild bird, said he, and he occasions me much solicitude. End quote. But Martin, who was not without talents, studied theology and it was only continued ill health that prevented him from publicly assuming the office of a preacher. He spent his life in private teaching. In an obituary notice of him it is said that, quote, 
he possessed such strong mental faculties and such striking oratorial powers as even to have excited the admiration of his father. End quote. Of the third son, Paul, when yet a child, Luther thus spoke, quote, He is destined to fight against the Turks, end quote, alluding to the energy of character then observed in him, and which was afterwards so strikingly developed. And truly, this Paul, endowed as he was with unusual decision and unshaken perseverance, was the most gifted of Luther's sons, even if he did not in all respects possess the heroic spirit of his father. He was not only a zealous promoter of the science of alchemy, so highly prized at that day, but he was a distinguished chemist, and succeeded by his assiduous labors in making many useful discoveries in chemistry and medicine. He also possessed a thorough knowledge of ancient languages, he was devoted with all his heart to the religious doctrines which his father restored, and defended them with zeal and ability. He was so strenuously attached to the orthodox system of theology that he once refused a very flattering call to the University of Jena on account of the presumed heresies which the theologian Victorine Strigel had promulgated at that seat of learning, and he soon afterwards received the appointment of private physician to John Frederick II at Gotha. In 1568 he served Joachim II of Brandenburg in the same capacity, by whom he was elevated to the rank of counselor and richly rewarded. Afterwards, 1571, he was employed by the elector August and his successor, Christian I, at Dresden. The former not only honored him by inviting him to be sponsor to his children, but also presented him with a farm, which, however, never came into the possession of his family, inasmuch as the subsequent times, during which the Calvinist Chancellor Krell held the helm of affairs, were not favorable to the prosperity of the sternly Lutheran Paul Luther. This same Calvinistic spirit, finally, was the occasion of his retiring into private life in 1590. He moved to Leipzig, where he died in 1593. At the baptism of this son, Luther said, quote, I have named him Paul, for St. Paul has taught us many great and glorious doctrines, and hence I have named my son after him. God grant that he may have the gifts and grace of the great apostle. If it please God, I will send all my sons away from home. If any one of them has a taste for the military profession, I will send him to Field Marshal Leuser. If any one wishes to study, him I will send to Jonas and Philip. If any one is inclined towards labor, him I will send to a farmer. End quote. But afterwards, when he became better acquainted with their disposition, he changed his mind. God forbid, said he, quote, that my sons should ever devote themselves to the study of the law. That would be my last wish. John will be a theologian. Martin is good for nothing. And about him, I have great fears. Paul must fight against the Turks, end quote. But, History teaches us that his wishes were not gratified. He himself subsequently advised Paul to study medicine, and the example of John induced all the educated sons of Luther's children for several generations to study law. The sixth child, Margaret, who entered into a happy matrimonial alliance, was dangerously attacked with fever after the measles, from which her brother suffered at the same time. Her father was much alarmed about her condition, but comforted himself with the thought that she would be taken out of this present evil world. She married George V. Kuhlheim, a civil officer in the Prussian service, 
who was a pious man and a most ardent admirer of Luther, and especially of his writings, of which his favorite one was Luther's exposition of the book of Genesis. So profound was his reverence for the Reformer, that the fact was thought worthy of being mentioned in the sermon preached at his funeral. His youngest son must have inherited his father's disposition and character, for he always esteemed it the highest possible honor to be the grandson of the great Luther. It is not known to what extent Catherine took part in the education of her children, but a woman of her mild and amiable temper and strong decision of character must have contributed much to the proper training of her offspring. These prominent traits exercised a subduing influence even on her husband, and Erasmus, who was at this time bitterly opposed to him, says, quote, Since Luther's marriage, he begins to be more mild and does not rave so fearfully with his pen as formerly. End quote. Presuming this to be true, it speaks well for the character of Catherine as a woman and a wife. Luther not only employed special teachers for his children, but also instructed them himself, notwithstanding his numerous other engagements. He says, quote, Though I am a doctor of divinity, still I have not yet come out of the school for children, and do not yet rightly understand the Ten Commandments, the Creed, and the Lord's Prayer but study them daily, and recite the catechism with my little Hans and Magdalena. End quote. For years he superintended their instruction, diligently watching their progress, and often giving them tasks to perform. But above all, he was solicitous about their religious and moral training, agreeably to his own sound principle. The father must speak out of the children, the proper instruction of children is their most direct way to heaven, and hell is not more easily earned than by neglecting them. They were taught to pray and to read the scriptures and other devotional books in the presence of the family. Particularly during their meals did he address them in impressive paternal admonitions. Morning and evening he assembled his numerous family, house teachers, guests, and domestics, to worship. When it is elsewhere said that Luther, quote, daily spent three hours in private devotion, end quote, it must be restricted to the period of the Diet of Augsburg, when he was concealed at Coburg. Luther, during all his life, was a man of prayer. Although he was opposed to mechanical formality in regard to special times and seasons, as he had been taught in the Church of Rome, yet he maintained a certain order and regularity in the performance of his Christian duty. Mathesius, one of his biographers, and a contemporary, says, quote, Every morning and evening, and often during meals, he engaged in prayer. Besides this, he repeated the smaller catechism and read the Psalter. In all important undertakings, prayer was the beginning, middle, and end. End quote. I hold, says Luther, quote, my prayer to be stronger than Satan himself. And if that were not the case, it would long since have been quite different with Luther. If I remit prayer a single day, I lose a large portion of the fire of faith. End quote. His writings contain many sparkling gems on the subject of prayer. Fondly as he was attached to his children, Yet he never showed a culpable indifference to their errors, and least of all when they were unruly or displayed anything like ingratitude or deception. On one occasion when John, at twelve years of age, was guilty of a gross impropriety, he would not allow him to come into his presence for three days, and paid no regard to the intercessions of the tender mother and of his intimate friends, Jonas and Crusager but forgave him only after he had repented of his fault and humbly begged for pardon. He said, quote, I would rather have a dead son than a rude and naughty living one. Paul has not in vain said, A bishop must be one who ruleth well his own house, 
having his children in subjection, so that other people may be edified, witnessing a good example, and not be offended. We ministers are elevated to such a high position in order to set a good example to others, but our uncivil children give offense to other people. Our boys wish to take advantage of our position and privileges, and sin openly. People do not inform me of the faults of mine, but conceal it from me. The common saying is fulfilled. We do not know the mischief done in our own families. We only discover it when it has become the town talk. Hence we must chastise them and not connive at their follies. End quote. Once, when he saw a youth of fine personal appearance and uncommon abilities, but of corrupt morals, he exclaimed, quote, Ah, how much evil and overindulgence occasions! Children are spoiled by allowing them too much liberty. Hence I shall not overlook the faults of my son John, nor shall I be as familiar with him hereafter as with his little sister. End quote. But Luther, though he received from his father a severe training, and was roughly treated at school, was too well acquainted with human nature not to know that undue severity in all things created a cowardly, slavish fear in the minds of some children, and obstinacy and dissimulation in others. Hence he pursued the golden medium and tried to accomplish his purpose by kind and yet earnest admonitions. Quote, I will not chastise Hans too severely, for he will become shy of me and hate me, End quote. said he. Quote, we must take care to teach the young to find pleasure in that which is good, for that which is forced out of them by stripes will not be profitable, and if this is carried to excess, they will only continue good as long as they feel the lash. But by admonition and judicious chastisement, they learn to fear God more than the rod. We must often stammer with children, and in all good things come down to a level with them. That is, we must be tender, affectionate, and condescending, and if that is of no avail, then we may employ severity. End quote. When he saw his wife or children suffering, his sympathizing heart often found relief in tears. I love my Catherine, he would say, quote, I love her more than I do myself. I would rather die myself than she and the children should die. End quote. It was only when the cause of religion was concerned that the dearest object on earth was not too dear for the honor of religion and truth, he would have sacrificed wife and children. Deeply penetrated with this sentiment, the magnanimous reformer, when he had already become the father of two children, could most cordially say, in the spirit of Christ's words, quote, Let them take my life, property, reputation, children, and wife. Let them all go. The kingdom of God is still ours. End quote. His heroic hymn, Ein Feisteberg ist unser Gott, sufficiently shows his feelings on this subject. End of section 8, chapter 7, part 2. Recording by Bill Mosley, Llano County, Texas, USA. Chapter 8 of Catherine de Bora, or Social and Domestic Scenes in the Life of Luther. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Larry Wilson. Catherine de Bora, or Social and Domestic Scenes in the Life of Luther, by John G. Morris. Chapter 8. Character of Catherine. It must be acknowledged that there is nothing remarkably striking in the history of Catherine de Bora, considered apart from her relation to her illustrious husband. She was distinguished by no extraordinary talents or surprising act of heroism after her marriage. 
she has left no literary monument to perpetuate her memory nor any public institution founded by her munificence she was nothing more than the virtuous woman so eloquently described by king solomon in the last chapter of the book of proverbs but she was that in an eminent degree a noble dignity and temperate self-reliance were the fundamental traits of her character hence though dependent upon others for support she possessed sufficient independence of mind to reject several brilliant offers of marriage and showed herself worthy of luther her resolution to exchange the noiseless cloister for a life of honourable and useful activity in the disturbed world without displayed not only a noble courage in the certain anticipation of poverty and persecution but also a strong confidence in god it is more than probable that she read many of luther's writings as soon as they appeared not actuated by a blind curiosity but with a sincere desire to ascertain the truth and to derive from them instruction for heart and head afterwards during her married life she took every opportunity of correcting and enlarging her religious views although as the result of the spirit of that age and of her previous monastic training she was not profoundly educated yet luther esteemed her as a woman possessing a noble dignified independent spirit in whose feelings and opinions he found an echo of his own pious in the proper sense of the word she found her highest enjoyment in solitary communion with god and those hours which she devoted to the attentive reading of the scriptures were always the most happy to this profitable exercise she was often exhorted by her husband and she followed his advice said she i hear a great deal of the scriptures and read them diligently every day in writing to jonas on one occasion luther says she is a diligent reader of the bible she shows deep earnestness in this duty she faithfully attended the public means of grace also and with her christian brothers and sisters worshipped god in the sanctuary she was devotedly attached to the doctrines of the reformation and one of her dying prayers was for their preservation in purity to the end of time she never neglected her domestic needs to her husband in all the relations of his active life she was the most affectionate companion in his sickness the most faithful nurse in his troubles the most tender comforter to her children she was a most gentle mother in her household affairs she was a model to all in regard to cleanliness order and neatness to her domestics and dependents a condescending and indulgent mistress she was liberal without extravagance economical without meanness hospitable without ostentation her questions and opinions still preserved in luther's writings show a strong desire for mental improvement an enlightened understanding a clear and dispassionate penetration this elevated intellectual character of catherine connected with her lofty independence and self-confidence created a distaste for the company of other less cultivated and less dignified ladies for the glory of her husband also encircled her head and the house of luther was the central point of union of the distinguished men of that day hence we need not wonder that by the envious she was accused of pride it is true that now after the lapse of three hundred years there may be many more refined and accomplished women than catherine was for she was not distinguished for learning or science but none exceed her in that pious christian disposition which was so forcibly expressed in her words and actions her lively temperament and affectionate heart admirably qualified her to feel the warmest sympathy in the diversified events of her husband's life and most kindly to participate with him in his joys and sorrows but above all it was not less her pious disposition than her persevering faith which identified her so completely with himself whenever the opposition of the enemy disturbed the quiet of the husband catherine never faltered for a moment and proceeded to administer consolation to his dejected heart during the prevalence of a contagious disease in fifteen twenty seven her confidence in god was not unshaken so that luther could in truth write catherine is yet strong in the faith also as a widow when she was subject to attacks of sickness and adverse circumstances her equanimity never entirely failed 
she was especially solicitous about her children and devoted all the energies of body and mind to their welfare it cannot be denied that catherine partook of the common lot of mortals she had her faults and infirmities but they are all overshadowed by those numerous exalted virtues which are not always found united in one person of her sex she was a pattern of every domestic and christian virtue of righteousness and good works to her generation and may the daughters and wives of present day imitate her example and profit by the practical lessons which her life has taught if she could make no pretensions to personal beauty still she possessed not a little that was attractive she was of medium size had an oval face a bright sparkling eye an expansive serene forehead a nose rather small lips a little protruding and cheekbones somewhat prominent erasmus speaks of her as a woman of magnificent form and extraordinary beauty but seckendorf says this is an extravagant picture of her the later opponents of luther agree with erasmus in representing her as very beautiful and falsely charge the reformer as being attracted only by her personal charms mainborg says among the nuns there was one named catherine von bora whom luther found to be very beautiful and whom on that account he loved Virilis and basuit report that he married a nun of high rank and uncommon beauty chaudon de la rochette relates the following fact i have found the likeness of luther and his wife in a lumber room in orleans where they are in great danger of going to ruin i will bet that there is no man who would not wish to have so beautiful a wife as catherine von bora it is the first time that i have seen her picture and it justifies the opinion which Bossuet has expressed of her appearance she has a noble expressive and animated face but luther himself says of her a wife is sufficiently adorned and beautiful when she pleases her husband whom she ought to please her likeness was frequently painted and at various periods of her life by the distinguished artists of that age such as cronach senior cronach junior and hans kolbein junior cronach senior painted her likeness in oil colors sixteen times and the other artists mentioned several times each many of these original portraits are still to be seen in the various picture galleries of europe there are extant more than forty different copper plate and wood engravings of her likeness it has also been transferred to porcelain ware and other articles of domestic use a number of medals containing her likeness have been struck to commemorate her virtues and plaster casts of the bust of full life size have also been made all this shows the high esteem in which she has ever been held by those who can appreciate exalted virtue and genuine christian character as a proof of her artistic skill and her proficiency in ornamental needlework even in that distant age there is to this day exhibited in the vestry room of the cathedral at merseburg a blue satin surplice which she embroidered for her husband and which he wore on the occasion of some great solemnity and in the former university library at wittenberg they still show a likeness of luther neatly and elegantly worked in silk by catherine but these works will perish whilst the results of her faith hope and charity will endure for ever end of chapter eight end of catherine de bora or social and domestic scenes in the life of luther by john g morris